For those of you who don't know me, I'm David Andelman, president of the Silurians Press Club. Now, there are any number of perks that accrue to the office of president. Let's see, I get to ride in an armored limousine, blow through traffic lights with a police escort and trail by an ambulance in case of emergency. I get to ride in a gilded jet that goes wherever I want. I get the best tea times on any golf course I show up at. No one dares talk back to me. I get to start trade wars on a whim. I get served first at any McDonald's. I decide I want to stop by and order anything on their menu. Oh, oh wait, that's the wrong president. What am I thinking? This president gets to open one of the great award ceremonies in American media, the Silurian Awards for Excellence in Journalism. So, I now declare this ceremony, this ceremony open. And to begin with, I'd like to have all of the winners here tonight stand for a round of applause. Look at that, the best in American journalism. Let's have our amazing awards chair, Jack Dacey, rise. Jack. Back. And our extraordinary and indefatigable dinner chair, Eileen Jacobs. <laughs> formerly a new thing. Our goal is to celebrate the best of the best from the media center of the world, New York. And we do. Just look around you in this room and listen to the awards as their winners are celebrated, and you'll see just what I mean. As we go through the awards tonight, we'll come across some inspired investigative journalism, whether it's directed at Trump's business empire, or political corruption on Long Island, or corporate environmental abuse, or shining a light on patient abuse in state institutions, or exposing an illicit prostitution operation in Queens, which is ruining the lives of young Asian women. We'll be reminded that investigative journalism moving feature writing, vivid photography, are all alive and well here as journalists keep seeking the truth in an age where it's so roundly debased. So I will solemnly declare that this is a no fake news zone. In a few minutes, I'll be calling on our featured speaker for a keynote address, Newsday's incomparable publisher, Debbie Krennick. But first, But first, I want to ask Debbie to join me in presenting several of the most noteworthy awards this evening. Debbie? Okay, to head up the list from her own Newsday, the winner of the Public Service Medallion for a most remarkable investigation of patient strangulation in state medical facilities, Will Van Sant. And we're going to ask Will to tell us just briefly how this all came about. Will? Will? Uh, thank, you. Yours. thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Um, and thank you, Silurians, uh, for your generous recognition of my modest story. I, uh, I, I deeply appreciate it. Um, this uh, came about, the story came about, um, because I was curious about uh, a state agency formed in 2013 that uh, had the responsibility of protecting vulnerable populations under state care from harm. Uh, the mentally ill uh, youth offenders uh, in prisons, developmentally challenged, etc. And I looked around at a lot of the work that had been done while admirable and necessary, was somewhat abstract, by which I mean there were stories like, well, there were this many complaints made to the agency, and there were only X number of prosecutions made, and why is that the case? And I thought, well, you know, this is an important agency. I'd like to learn more. I want to find someone on the inside who uh, can tell me what's really going on. And I was fortunate enough to find the agency's uh, special prosecutor and inspector general at a moment in her life when she was reconsidering her allegiance to the Code of Omerta in state government. And uh, she began talking to me and she described a situation in which she attempted to examine and study uh, 
a pattern of strangulation assault by caregivers at institutions across the state. And that effort was stymied by others in state government who were concerned about the appearance of the special prosecutor being engaged in this kind of work. And uh, uh, it was a long process, by which I mean I always think that this woman, Patricia Gunning, was going to, wanted to tell her story, but she needed to do so when she was ready. And um, it took time. You know, I talked with Patricia Gunning for maybe a year. Uh, and while I was engaged in, in other stuff, it was a lengthy process. And um, I'm fortunate to work uh, at a newspaper that is willing to dedicate resources to a story like this and to have patience to get a story like this. And uh, so I'm, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that opportunity. I think that uh, it's a luxury that too few reporters in this country have. Um, and I also have to express my appreciation to Patricia Gunning uh, and her willingness and her bravery to come forward and, and uh, tell about uh, her experience in uh, New York State government. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, next, the Silurians Medall Medallion for Minority Affairs reporting. Christina Vega and Samuel Park from Chalkbeat for a look at the stunning reaction of Upper West Side parents to plans to integrate their children's middle school with a school just uptown in Harlem. Um, Christina and uh, Samuel, are you here? Yes, please. award in this category goes to Victor Manuel Ramos of Newsday for his inside look. Bravo. At one of the most violent cliques of the Salvadoran gang MS-13. Victor, please stand up. Next, the Silurian medallion for TV feature reporting goes to Walt Kane of News 12 New Jersey for his amazing look at the complicity of the state in cover-ups of concussions on roller coaster rides. <laughs> Finally, for right now, for commentary, the, the category I judge for myself, judge myself with our great sage and former Silurian president Mike Candell, who's in our room here. Um, the Silurian Medallion goes to Jim Dwyer of the New York Times for his amazing, his amazing About New York column that truly really captured the texture of our great city. And I'd love to ask Jim to say a few words about what is clearly a labor of love. But first, you're going to get your medallion. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Sure. Uh, when I was pretty young, I went on a vacation down to South Carolina to the beaches, and uh, there were these beautiful brown gulls flying along, and they would suddenly zoom down, get their meal, right? And they actually had no predators. The way they ended up dying was they went blind from hitting the water over and over and over again, and they couldn't catch fish. And I was afraid that one day, after four decades of writing columns, <laughs> I would go blind from, I wouldn't be able to see anything anymore. And thankfully, being in this city and be, having the privilege of being a local reporter, where the world keeps spinning and there are new things to look at all the time, uh, I'm still able to make my way back and forth from the table to here. I'm able to feed myself. And I, I'm just very grateful to uh, have had this chance to be a reporter in New York for so long and to be a member of your tribe, uh, alumni of many great news organizations. And my uh, colleagues here tonight who are being honored, I'm, I'm so grateful to be part of your moment. Thanks a lot. Mm. 
now, oh, I'm sorry, the Merit Award for commentary goes to Randall Forsyth of Barron's. Randall, please stand up. A great man and a great institution. Now comes the moment that I, for one, have been waiting so eagerly to happen. Our keynote address from a remarkable woman who has carried a torch for newspapers as the guarantors of our democracy and our freedom for so many years, and who continues to guide one of our greatest, Newsday, from strength to strength, as we can see from the awards he's taking home tonight, but as well for its unsurpassed coverage every day of the year, all the time. Debbie Krennic. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to the Solarians uh, for having me here this evening. I am really so honored to be in this room full of excellence. All the award-winning reporters and editors, photographers, videographers, your work has never been more threatened, yet never more important than it is today. It's wonderful to see all the great work that's been honored here tonight. The last time I spoke in front of the Solarians was actually in the late 90s, shortly after just being named editor of the New York Daily News. And things were quite different then, for one, there were many fewer women in that room than there are, uh, there are here tonight, and only a handful in top positions across the media companies across the country. It's so nice to see that that has changed. It was also a time I like to call BI, before internet. There was no Facebook, no Google. Uh, Google was not the search engine of choice, and newspapers were uh, anywhere from 600,000 to a million circulation dailies were common. I know I'm really dating myself here. So, uh, Donald Trump was on the front page of the tabloids uh, often. And okay, I admit that hasn't changed. So. <laughs> Tonight, uh, I wanted to talk about the crisis everyone says news is facing, especially local news. Um, but to do that, I need to give you a little context about uh, my past and my passion for local news. My story has a lot of twists and turns. It has craziness that sometimes took me off the road of journalism and kindnesses from mentors that put me back on it. I ended up in a place that I never dreamed possible uh, when I was a kid. Um, so how does someone from Taylor, Texas, a town of 13,000 people in the middle of nowhere, wind up in the news business in New York City? Um, I've always loved to write. And in high school, uh, I actually signed up for a stenographer class because I thought that might be helpful. Um, but it was full, so I wound up in a journalism class instead. Uh, became editor of the high school paper because the teacher thought I could actually write. And I had no fear when it came to asking the principal the tough questions that all the students wanted to know. Um, in the summers, I was an intern at the Taylor Daily Press because my dad was a fishing buddy with the publisher. I think I covered everything from city hall meetings to uh, features on communities, took photos, worked in the composing room, even sold ads. It was a really small place. Um, but all of this was done under the watchful eye of an editor and a no-nonsense reporter who was working hard to really teach me the basics of reporting. Um, I guess my most striking memory of that was one night when the editor called me at home late at night. Uh, someone had been run over by a drunk driver, and they sent me out to cover it. The experience uh, was exhilarating because I couldn't believe they trusted me to do that, um, but it was hard. Um, it was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body. It was the first time I ever talked to a grieving family. Um, and, you know, that experience has stayed with me for uh, all of my career, and I'm sure many of you have something very similar to that. Um, after college, I went to the Dallas Times Herald, a scrappy little paper that was intent on beating the Dallas Morning News. Um, worked on the news desk and the city desk. Uh, we had six editions starting at 6 a.m. from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the afternoon. I was in charge of tearing up all those editions because we were constantly breaking news. I guess that kind of sounds like the internet, right? Um, moved to New York in 1987 when my husband, uh, Jim Roberts, okay, I'm going to give a shameless plug for at NYC Jim, which I'm sure you guys all follow on Twitter, <laughs> uh, got a job with the New York Times. Um, my first encounter with New York newspaper life was meeting with the managing editor at the Daily News. He kind of looked over me, he was an imposing bearded fellow, and he looked over his glasses at me and said in a really challenging tone, you know, what do you think you can, can you do good tabloid writing and editing? 
I looked at him and I said, I absolutely can, at all the time having no idea whether I could or couldn't. Um, so, but as it turned out, the Daily News, despite all of its craziness and headlines, was known for tough co coverage of the city and really uh, uncovering many injustices. I arrived not knowing that New York had even five boroughs. After all, why would a Texan know that? Uh, but I learned from the toughest and the best. Editor Jim Wilsey, uh, city editors Arthur Brown, Rich Rosen, uh, John Landeman. Um, I also had the pleasure of working with Marty Gottlieb, who was managing editor there at one point. Was working long days and long nights, but we were taking names and kicking butt, and that was a lot of fun, and people noticed, and it really felt great. When I became editor of the Daily News, I really uh, wanted to carry on the work that Jim Wilsey championed. And our uh, investigative reporting by Jim Dwyer, who just won an award here, uh, was uh, also won awards for uh, rolling, back the surplus, rolling back the subway fares in New York City. Uh, one of my proudest moments, though, is when the New York Daily News and Mike McClary won the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the brutal beating of an immigrant in custody in the 70th precinct in Brooklyn. Um, at that time, the Daily News had a new editor every two to three years. I thought I might be the one to change that, but, that, but I wasn't. Um, so after 13 years at the news, then came my pivot to pets. <laughs> I wanted to get the internet because I thought it was going to be big. Uh, but this was in 2000, and as many of you remember, that was the, inter the year that the internet really went into a literal crash. So I had gone to work for an outfit called Pet Place. It was an up-and-coming pet website with pets.com uh, of stock, sock puppet fame. Arthur Brown came with me, and we did a lot of serious, quote, pet coverage, breaking news, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, we were totally ahead of our time, but in a field that was going nowhere. <coughs> Fortunately, editor Tony Marrow called me up about starting a New York City website. Bingo, back in the news. Really happy about that. So over the years at Newsday, I built up Newsday, we got into apps, video, and social. And in 2010, I became editor. And it was really an incredible honor to lead that room of fearless journalists. Newsday is known for its investigative coverage, and I'm proud to say that over the years, under the direction of editor Debbie Henley, our coverage has led to almost a dozen Long Island officials being indicted or convicted of corruption, including a county executive, police chief, and more. Our owner, Pat Dolan, is himself an outstanding journalist. Uh, he wanted to be here tonight, and he couldn't, um, but he sends his congratulations to everyone in the room. I took the job of publisher because, like Pat, I wanted to safeguard our reporting. Without strong reporting, you have nothing. It's also about the challenge and opportunity to head the entire organization to a new model of economic sustainability, because that's the only way to protect journalism. Because you see, the truth and journalism itself are under the greatest assault we've seen in our lifetimes. Many news organizations um, legacy newspapers in particular are struggling to make their business models work. And in this highly polarized political climate, we are often under attack for reporting on tough issues. The doomsayers, or are they realists, have been pronouncing the newspaper industry dead for almost as long as I've been in the business. And that's a long time. <laughs> but now the cacophony is growing louder and more constant. Our president has called us the enemy of the people. Top officials, both national and local, won't answer our questions. Cries of fake news can be heard around the country. And Facebook and Google have taken millions in revenue that used to go to news outlets. Uh, Warren Buffett, who owns Berkshire Hathaway and the Buffalo News, uh, among the papers, recently told Yahoo Finance that newspapers are toast and that most will disappear, with the notable exception of the big three. And the Wall Street Journal, in a lengthy examination of what ails our industry recently, said that local newspapers are on the endangered species list because they haven't made the transition to digital. Um, newsroom employment has fallen 71,000 from 71,000 in 2008 to, uh, to uh, 39,000 in 2017. And ad revenue has fallen from 60 billion in 2000 
to $16.5 billion in 2017. Journalists are faced in the U.S. and internationally um, are facing heightened danger. 54 journalists were killed last year around the world, and four were killed last year in the Capitol, Capitol Gazette. Um, last March, I went to my alma mater, Texas A&M, to do a speech uh, at a fundraiser that was trying to save the college newspaper. Funding had been cut, reporters were no longer being paid, and what they did, they did for free because they were really so passionate about learning the craft. This crisis in local news has reached all the way down to the bottom of the funnel. And this is the very place where young journalists learn the ropes, beginning their journeys to the news days, the CNNs, and the New York Times of the world. It's, it's probably the toughest time that I can remember in our profession. And yet, we're still here. Um, what the metrics don't convey and what Buffett didn't really acknowledge is the lasting power and the potency of journalism to help people live their lives in an ever more complex world and to make a difference in those lives. From healthcare to education and the environment to immigration, people are craving reliable information. And it's this information that's so critical to sustaining our democracy. When facts aren't reported, bad policies and politics flourish. It's always been that quality is the key and the constant. It's the essence of what we do in words and images. Accurate, fact-based reporting and clarity of language that provides context and detail and transparency. That's in the, reflected in the work of all of the honorees tonight. Um, it's the kind of compelling storytelling across the platforms that is essential in order to make ourselves indispensable and relevant. After all, we are most often storytellers and truth tellers. Back when the news media flourished economically, we all had the luxury of not knowing or caring about um, the business matters. At papers large and small, um, there were world bureaus, 20-person Washington bureaus, and it, yeah, that was really sweet. Uh, we could go on about being reporters and editors and let everyone else worry about revenue, margins, metrics, and analytics. But now we must be, must be much more aware of the business that provides our voice and our paychecks. Technology and social media have opened up a whole new world of how we gather, authenticate, and report the news. It's actually really the golden age of storytelling when you think about it, and it's exciting. We have so many tools now to get at the truth and to tell the truth in really creative and imaginative ways. We have so much data that allows us to do these deep stories, and those are the stories that are changing people's lives. You keep hearing about them over and over again at these awards ceremonies, and it's really wonderful. Um, Smart and determined editors and publishers at places like Newsday and the New York Times and The Guardian are transitioning and creating sustainable business models. And so are digital-only outlets where the content is smart and thoughtful. Um, but this doesn't come without bumps along the road. We've made mistakes and we've learned from them. The days of the page view race and clickbait are waning, thank goodness. Uh, and many businesses are caught in that whipsaw. People are looking for trusted content that connects with them. Those who supply that will be winners, and in the end, more readers are willing to pay for trusted journalism. We're seeing that over and over again. I just came from a conference at INLA, and I was so heartened to hear so many of the places that are really starting to make that switch. Um, one of the students at the uh, A&M fundraiser that I was talking about earlier came up to me and asked me afterward for advice. Uh, that what, I had, what advice I had for a student journalist. Should I do video? Should I do social? My advice was all of those are really important to know, but first and foremost, you have to get the facts and you have to understand the story to be able to tell it to your audience no matter what the platform, because the platforms are always gonna change, but the story will never change. Think about how lucky we are. As past, present, and future journalists, to be in a profession that is the heart of the pillars of our democracy. A free press is key to all of our freedoms. We have to protect that. We have to continue to fight for it. 
the attacks on our integrity of our profession have put us in a position that we don't like and maybe we didn't even sign up for, but here we are. And the truth is, uh, the truths that we tell are more essential than ever. Yes, the future is uncertain, but the possibilities are many. Our tradition as journalists is one of overcoming obstacles. It's one of courage and it's one of principle. And that's a tradition worth fighting for. Thank you all so much. And now, if that wasn't inspiring, I don't know what inspiration is, but um, I, when I thought that um, I'd ask the perfect person to uh, set the tone for because our keynoter, I hit on the right one. So, thank you. Now it's time for the business of the evening, to hand out the rest of our amazing awards. And to start us off, we begin with one of my predecessors as president of the Solorians, a brilliant journalist in her own right, and an amazing portrait painter as well. Thank you. <laughs> Betsy Ashton. Betsy. Thank you, David, and hello, everybody. It's delightful to be here. This is always a fun time to celebrate Great journalism, and God knows we need it, don't we, ever today. Uh, it is my pleasure, my privilege, to present medallions in seven of the categories. Investigative reporting, environmental reporting, business and finance reporting, radio feature reporting, television breaking news, arts and culture reporting, and health and science reporting. Now, first let's look at the investigative reporting. As David Andelman noted earlier, investigative journalism is alive and well in the New York metropolitan area and well represented in this room tonight. Not surprisingly, several of those excellent winning investigative research efforts have been focused on the Trump business empire. Mueller's wasn't the only team that was digging into Trump's business world. The New York Times investigative team of David Barstow, Suzanne Craig, and Russ Butner spent over a year of exhaustive research to tell the complex story of the legally dubious history of the Trump family business. Among other findings, they reported that Trump received today's equivalent of $413 million from his father's real estate empire. Made himself rich, right? <clears throat> and that much of it came from questionable tax schemes during the 1990s, including outright fraud. For their amazing effort in putting together Trump and tax, the medallion for investigative reporting goes to David Barstow, Suzanne Craig, and Russ Butner of the New York Times. <laughs> I guess this story could have been like local boy makes good, so I, <laughs> all news may be local and Donald Trump is an example of that for us. And I just, I really want to thank the Slurians for celebrating local journalism tonight. This story to me, when I look back at sort of where the origins of it were, it started in the Metro department, the New York Times. I was a Metro reporter and Russ Butner and I and David Barstow were called together to cover Trump's finances in general, and while I was working in Metro, we got sent the tax, three pages of the tax returns from Donald Trump, and that's sort of where it all started. And local reporting is like great in New York because it can be national, it can be local, it can be a lot of things. And I just feel like Metro reporting is so important to what we do, and this is kind of where it started. So, and I, this is a just a really magical pro, you know project for so many reasons that, you know, when I look at just how great everything, like, I don't know, I'm like losing my words now, but just, um, it, it started with really simple questions and led us on this great journey. And I'm just, he, when you look at sort of the presidency and how just, 
his history and how it's so intertwined with New York and the lies that were sort of embedded in in where he got and where we you know just be just to be able to unravel that was such a great you know achievement and I just want to thank David and Russ and my editors and everybody else so thank you very much we also want to make note that there were two merit awards in this investigative category Joe Goldstein's Excellent Blue Lies for the New York Times, and Zachary Mider, Zeke Foe, David Ingold, and Demetrius Pocus of Bloomberg for uncovering a new form of predatory lending. Joe Goldstein of the Times is here. Joe, please stand up and take a bow. Great. Over there. Moving on to environmental reporting, what could be a more important topic these days? Another outstanding investigative team, this one from the record, NorthJersey.com, examined 40 years worth of records and interviewed regulators, elected officials, and 50 current and former homeowners on their way to exposing how DuPont downplayed the extent of groundwater contamination at their now closed munitions factory in New Jersey. In a four-part series, they reported that three decades after DuPont signed an agreement with the state of New Jersey to clean up the contamination, the toxic groundwater was still migrating beneath and vaporizing in the basements of 400 homes. Because of this series, New Jersey is now investigating the cleanup efforts. For their excellent work, reporters Jim O'Neill and Scott Fallon and photojournalist Chris Padota win the medallion for environmental reporting. Please come on up here. Okay, good. A couple of words from somebody? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Solarians. Um, I think the only thing I have to say is that um, the legacy of industrial pollution is something that affects communities everywhere. And it affects the communities that you cover. Uh, I think that this is a universal story. This is something that you guys can tackle within your own newsrooms to serve your own readers. Uh, it is everywhere. Uh, it is certainly not limited to the folks in Pompton Lakes, New Jersey, that we spent many times, many months, many years with, uh, documenting uh, the effect of pollution on that community. So I encourage you to uh, look at this. And you don't have to be an environmental reporter. A local reporter can tackle these issues as much as anybody who has years of experience in environmental reporting. So I encourage you to look at this in your own newsrooms, in your own communities, in the readers that you serve. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Fallon. Business and financial reporting, and of course, this city is full of it. Just a year and a half after Wells Fargo, <laughs> just a year and a half after Wells Fargo executive Christopher Lewis joined the bank's wealth management group in Los Angeles, he found himself working on overdrive to counteract what he viewed as systemic fraud fueled by a casual disregard for federal regulations. His bosses eventually offered him a deal. Lewis could stay at Wells if, and only if, he remained silent. Yet his conscience bothered him and he chose to speak up and became a whistleblower. In her piece, Keep Quiet, financial planning senior editor Ann Marsh details Lewis's struggles both internal and with company executives before he was fired, sued, and eventually won a multi-million dollar settlement. Marsh uncovered confidential emails and previously undisclosed government documents to recreate Lewis's battles. For this example of determined reporting, Anne Marsh of Financial Planning wins the medallion for business and financial reporting. Congratulations, Anne Marsh. 
um, it's, it's so gratifying to uh, have this recognition for this award. This um, was an individual who um, contacted me. He was in the High Net Worth Wealth Management Division of Wells. And all the Wells frauds, of course, were at the retail level, and you were hearing about sort of everyday folks off the street being, you know, the victims of fraud. So this opened up a whole new area of abuse that the bank was allegedly engaging in. And I spent like, I don't know, half a year having the most intense discussions with this individual, hours and hours and hours, and he was broken, like broken to his core. Things, I guess, well, can I say that? <laughs> what can I say? Uh, no, I guess I can't. It was just really rough, and it was very dramatic. I wanted to tell everything, and it was all off the record, but it was so important, I thought, um, it's okay, well, he'll come on the record at some point. And instead, he settled, probably because of the reporting we were doing, because Wells knew that we were doing really aggressive reporting about them. So I thought, oh my gosh, like, what are those four months of like wasted time? I can't, but what was I thinking, right? And I had a source who's a former government official who one day sent me an email and said, I, and I, I found this file on Wells and um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I was looking for that. I didn't know where it was, but yeah, maybe you'll be interested in it. And it was his entire case file for his OSHA whistleblower case with every document backing up everything he'd been telling me. So it was like, how ser isn't that incredibly serendipitous? Like they didn't know each other, these two. He, the person didn't know. this. Christopher Lewis had received this OSHA award anonymously. We were the only people who knew his name. So it was really cool. And I have to say, no, very few of you probably know what financial planning is. We're not a title that people tend to know. But I was really proud that I was able to convince him that we were the right publication to give the story to. And so it was cool. So thanks so much. You're here. Sure. We all ho also have two fine merit awards in this category. Paper Jam by Fortune's Sean Kelly on Xerox's unsuccessful attempt to merge with Fujifilm, and the Associated Press's Trump business team on how Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner might profit from a tax break they helped to push through. We have Sean Tully of Fortune here. Sean, please stand and take a bow. If you got a merit award, you did excellent work. It's just all around. Now, radio feature reporting, and unfortunately, the, the teams could not be with us here tonight, but it's worth mentioning the medallion goes to WNYC ProPublica's investigative staffs for their podcasts of Trump Incorporated. In an, age when the high, in an age when the highest levels of government are arrayed against fact-finding and truth-telling, WNYC and ProPublica combined their investigative staffs to produce an ongoing series of podcasts that uncovered wrongdoing and conflicts of interest in the Trump business empire. For their first-rate collaborative journalism, WNYC and ProPublica win the medallion for radio feature reporting, and we're going to see that they get it, and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, the television people are here tonight. They're at my table. Uh, television breaking news. Presenting this award, I have to tell you, it, it takes me back to my years spent out covering everything imaginable with camera crews, back when they had two-man crews. Yes, generally all men, and their backs generally went out because uh, the, the sound man was always carrying a 40-pound tape deck. So that dates me, right? But I digress. Anyway, the rush hour snowstorm expected on November 17th, very early in the season, was supposed to be minor. But when five inches of snow fell and fell quickly, the city and residents were caught off guard. The snow brought everything to a standstill, stranding thousands of commuters at train and bus terminals, paralyzing traffic, trapping drivers in cars, and causing a blinding mess of road accidents. But the 11 p.m. Eyewitness News team was ready. 
The news team covered the storm like no other television station. They had reporters covering all the angles, reporting on the political implications, and providing on-the-scene reports from transportation hubs and clogged roadways. They had up-to-the-minute information on the impa impact of the storm, the dangerous issues people faced throughout the night, and what people could expect the next morning. For their excellent coverage, the 11 p.m. team at Eyewitness News wins the medallion for television breaking news, and we have two of their executive producers here, and the one in charge of the 11 p.m. news, Brian Lenniker, is here to accept for his team. Brian, come on up here. Um, well, it's quite an honor to be here tonight amongst everyone here, but it's also an honor to accept this award on behalf of uh, the team at Channel 7 and WABC. Um, I mean, what we do every night there, we couldn't do without a team. I mean, we send, you know, just a few reporters out and they have to cover the entire Tri-State. So it's quite an honor to be recognized for that. Uh, this year we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of WBC and it's this kind of awards that help us kind of just give the energy to keep going for the next 50 years. So thanks again very much. Moving on to arts and culture reporting. Welcome to Brighton Beach is an exuberant, warm, and funny profile of the insular Soviet emigre community on Brighton Beach, which the writer describes as Coney Island's grumpy neighbor, where the sea turns to vodka and the newspapers to Cyrillic. The profile is illustrated with marvelous photos of the community and its residents. You can read an excerpt from the essay and see a few of those photos on page 7 of the Silurian News, which you have at your places. The piece appeared in the Metropolitan section of the Sunday New York Times, and I am delighted to present the Medallion for Arts and Culture Reporting to writer Yelena Aktiorskaya. That's it, right? All right. And, and reporter Alexei Yurenev. Yurenev? Oh, thank God. We are happy to have Yelena and Alexei both here to receive their well deserved medallion and applause. There you are. There you are. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, Thank you, guys. Um, I mean, thank you, you know, the people who chose it, and all of you very serious journalists um, who, um, so um, this, I, I'm not a journalist. I'm a uh, novelist, um, I think. Uh, but um, this piece sort of um, came in the most amazing way, which is like both by total happenstance, um, and I was also um, preparing to write it my entire life, um, which I think is uh, a really good way to come at an article. Um, and But it began because of Alexi's photographs. Um, they, you know, I, I grew up in Brighton Beach, so I, I thought there was no more that you could really say about it. Like, it was really, I was just like at my saturation point with it. Um, but then the, the photographs came and they were really, um, really beautiful and eerie and strange. And then I saw the place where I grew up in a completely new and, sh and different way. And I kind of, you know, you, you can only love and hate it if you really know it. Um, but I felt like both the love and the hate, you know, extremely anew. And I felt, um, and, I, and it was sort of with that passion that I felt like I wrote this, uh, this piece. Um, and and, um, so it, and it turned out to be sort of like a love letter to Brighton Beach. And then, you know, Brighton Beach turned out to be in a little bit of a way, a little bit too deranged to even take it. <laughs> to accept it. Yeah. To accept it. Uh, so we, we've been dealing with a lot of, like, you know, anger from the Brighton Beachers. <laughs> <laughs> since it came out, but it's all worth it because this is so, I'm so proud to be here. I'm so happy. Thank you. Moving on to health and science reporting. Same-day surgery centers 
have become such an integral part of the medical landscape that reporter Lindy Washburn of The Record, NorthJersey.com, decided to find out how they operated. What she discovered was that the centers, typically owned by doctors or anesthesiologists, are very loosely regulated by New Jersey. They often have skeleton staffs, improper and or outdated equipment, and can hire people who may not have made the cut at a regular hospital. In some cases, these lapses spawned infections in patients. In other cases, they led to death. Lindsay's reporting encompassed heart-wrenching interviews with family members, deep dives into hard-to-find data, wrangling with lawyers and regulators, and many, many visits to many, many centers. In the end, Washburn exposed a glaring weakness in New Jersey's medical system, so much so that lawmakers began changing and strengthening the regulations that cover the center's operations. For her excellent investigative piece, she wins the medallion for health and science reporting. Now, Lindy is not here tonight, but accepting for her, we have her editor, Jim O'Neill of the record. There were two merit awards in this category. The Associated Press's Jennifer Peltz wrote an excellent piece about New York City's efforts to stem opioid overdoses. And Delthea Ricks of Newsday did a superb report about the discovery of a new form of lung cancer. They are not here tonight, but we can applaud for the excellent work all around. And now let me invite our next presenter to come to the podium. You may know Mort Scheinman as the longtime managing editor of Women's Wear Daily or W Magazine uh, and the writer photographer of many travel adventure stories. We know him as a former president of the Silurians and as our longtime membership chairman, Mort Scheinman. Thank you, Betsy. Just want to say good evening, my fellow Silurians. And welcome to all of our distinguished guests. After spending the last couple of months reading some of the best journalism produced anywhere in the country, it's a privilege and honor and a relief to finally meet some of the people whose efforts turned out to be the best of the best. To put this evening in context, the Silurians have been giving out these awards for almost three quarters of a century. The first winner of a Silurian award was William L. Lawrence of the New York Times, who was cited in 1945 for his eyewitness coverage of, an atom of the dropping of an atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, an event that helped hasten the end of World War II and at which Lawrence was the sole representative of the world press. Each of tonight's winners join an honor roll of journalists whose names have become legend in the industry and the history of American media. Now let me invite you to join us, the Silurians Press Club, as we continue our journey of honoring the work of our colleagues and promoting the value to democracy of a free press. As membership chairman of the club, I know we'd love to have you come aboard. If you've been in the business for nine years or more, and I suspect you all have, you qualify. In addition to our two gala dinners each year, we have monthly lunches, except in July and August, we meet right here at the National Arts Club for a three-course meal and a drink and a guest speaker. If you're at all interested in joining, and I hope you are, I have membership applications with me. <laughs> so look for me and we'll talk. I'll be around. End of commercial, and now to the business at hand. I'd like to start with one of my favorite categories, sports reporting. Once upon a time, we read the sports pages because they were all about the athletes and the games they played. 
Sports were a wonderful and badly needed distraction from the other stories in a daily news report. Stories of crime and corruption, scandal and skullduggery. That was yesterday. Today is different. A good sports writer these days often needs to know much more than the rules of the game. He, or more and more often, she, needs the tools of a political correspondent and an investigative reporter to monitor events outside the lines of play. Our medallion winner in this year's sports reporting category exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about. For six months, he doggedly dug into an FBI investigation of how businessmen and coaches schemed to create a climate of corruption involving high school basketball players, college recruiters, and executives of sneaker companies. An investigation that produced guilty pleas, resignations, and convictions. He traveled from high school gyms to Las Vegas hotel rooms to federal courthouses, and he listened to government wiretaps and scoured documents obtained through FOIA requests. For through the looking glass, his sweeping look at the underbelly of today's sports world, the 2019 medallion for sports reporting goes to Kevin Armstrong, who wrote it for the New York Daily News. There's a footnote to Kevin's story. It was published in the news in March 2018. But when the news went through huge layoffs, Kevin and many of his colleagues lost their jobs. There is, however, a happy ending. Kevin found another job. He's now in the sports department of the New York Times, covering the Mets. Come on up, Kevin. Get your medallion. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. For full disclosure, I used to work in the sports department of the Daily News. Uh, as you already know, in addition to the medallions awarded in various categories, we uh, also uh, present certificates of merit to runners-up. The Merit Award winners have already received their certificates, but we'd like to introduce and applaud them right now for his piece called Hard, Hard Knocks about the decline in memory and cognitive uh, uh, functions among lacrosse players in Long Island schools. The Merit Award in Sports Reporting goes to Jim Baumbach of Newsday. He's here tonight. He's here tonight, so Jim, please stand and check the bow. I'd like to continue by talking about the winner of our People Profiles category. The man who was profiled in this strange and beautifully written story is not a household name. Not unless your house is a Bowery flop house. He isn't in show business, but he can be enormously entertaining. He's an artist and a poet of singular talent and a folk hero of sorts to his friends. The name by which people know him isn't a real name, a, a name you can find on a birth certificate or a social security card or even a metro card. He's a 70-year-old fellow in a, flop house, in a fedora who has been living on the Bowery since the mid-1990s. He's one of the last remaining residents of one of the last remaining flop houses that once lined New York's Bowery. And he says, a man with a million dollars doesn't have what I have. His own story, who he is, and how he got to where he is was a mystery until April 1st, 2018, when Sir Shadow appeared as the star of a Sunday morning piece in the Metropolitan section of the New York Times. In this compelling, compassionate profile, Sir Shadow has been brought into the light. I'm pleased to announce that the 2019 medallion 
for the People's Profiles category goes to Alex Vaducal of the New York Times for Sir Shadow, maestro of the last of the Bowery flop houses. His touching tribute, <laughs> his touching tribute to a man most of us might otherwise never have noticed. Alex Vaducal. Uh, there are two merit awards for the People Profile category. One to Michael Paulson of the New York Times for his colorful profile of an equally colorful man, Broadway producer Jordan Roth. And one to Amanda Fortini, whose piece in Vanity Fair on the very private Michelle Williams was unusually <coughs> revealing. Um, <coughs> Ms. Fortini is not here tonight. Accepting the award in her place is Vanity Fair's executive editor, Claire Howarth. And Michael Paulson, if you're here, I believe you are, could you please stand and take a bow? There he is, back there. Michael Paulson. And Claire Howarth. I know you're here because I spoke to you before. Excepting for Amanda. Amanda Fortini. Thank you. When one thinks of stunning sports photography, our next category, <coughs> one might imagine images of bodies in motion, athletic bodies in rugged, intense contact with other equally fit bodies, or of balletic bodies defying <laughs> gravity. Force, power, and grace are often the key elements. This year's medallion winning entry, a series of eight photographs, is different. It simply depicts a couple of people talking to, one, uh, to each other, but it is filled with drama and emotion. She's not here. It's a series of images of a female tennis player competing in the finals of the 2018 U.S. Open, a match between Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. The confrontation that is the focus of the photos is not between the players. It's between Williams, shouting, tearful, and seething with rage, and the chair umpire, a man named Carlos Ramos, and it was sparked by controversial calls by Ramos against Williams that cost her the match and the championship. All the drama and emotion of what happened are reflected by the photographs. The shapeless, deformed tennis rackets that Serena Williams had smashed against the court. Williams pointing an accusatory finger at Ramos while telling him he was a thief and owed her an apology. The indignant and angry look on Serena's face as she sat fuming in her chair. The two tennis players embracing as umpire Ramos regarded them impassively from his perch high above. For pictures that perfectly captured the drama and emotion of a match that polarized the tennis community and drew worldwide attention, the 2019 medallion for sports photography goes to J. Conrad Williams, Jr. of Newsday. Okay. Okay. Next up, the feature photography category. Fortune magazine calls them the service class. 65 million Americans who work at low-wage, low-skill jobs oriented around routine and service-based occupations such as retail workers, consumer service reps, food and hospitality employees, and other clerical and administrative positions. In New York City, the cost of living has gone up as the employment rate, I'm sorry, as the unemployment rate dropped. 
yet the percentage of households with inadequate income has more or less remained the same, forcing some folks to work at more than one job. To document the story, Fortune interviewed three service class New Yorkers, a medical biller who is also an Uber driver, a secretary at Mount Sinai Health System, and a records manager slash athletic trainer, as these people struggle to provide for their families. The people spoke about the challenges of day-to-day -day life, how their pasts have impacted their current situation, and their hopes for the future through job growth and higher education. Their stories are illuminated by a series of intimate portraits of the three families going about their daily routines, riding the subway to work, putting their children to bed, sharing a meal, enjoying an afternoon on a park bench. For his photos that tell you almost as much about the families as the accompanying text, the 2019 medallion for feature photography goes to Andre Wagner of Fortune for the shrinking middle class tales of New York City. Andre Wagner, please. <laughs> if he is not here, is there someone from Fortune who is going to accept this on his behalf? My pleasure. Thank you there so you go. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. There is also a merit award in this category, and it goes to Thomas A. Ferrara of Newsday. <laughs> Mr. Ferrara wins for a delightful photo essay called Mermaids of Long Island, about a group of Long Island ladies who, with the aid of costumes, practice, and performance, transform themselves into these mystical, magical denizens of the deep. Tom, I have a feeling we'll see you again tonight. <laughs> Spoiler alert. The opening paragraphs of our 2019 feature reporting medallion winner describes a woman, quote, with her long dark hair in a ponytail, unquote, plummeting to her death from the fourth floor of a building in the Flushing section of Queens. What follows is a brilliant piece of investigative reporting and compelling prose that traces the operation of an Asian sex ring where women like J.D. Ponytail, Jane Doe Ponytail, as the initial police report described her, guarantee, these women guarantee happy endings to the patrons of the massage parlors that flourish in this part of Queens. To dig out the story behind the story took almost a year and required a blend of skills. To begin, there were language barriers. Flushing is the second largest Chinatown outside Asia. About a dozen dialects are spoken and the people who operate illicit businesses there do not exactly provide translators for inquiring reporters. Enter a freelance journalist named Jeffrey Singer, a man fluent in Mandarin and regional dialects and a former resident of Flushing. Mr. Singer is the guy who helped bring the outsiders inside. The outsiders were Dan Barry, who was the primary writer. Dan Barry, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigator, known for telling the stories of ordinary people. Photographer Todd Heisler, whose pictures, a combination of stills and videos, capture the dazzle and detail that give this tragic story the ambience of a film noir. For their work in gaining the confidence of an insular community and producing the case 
of Jane Doe Ponytail. The 2019 Feature Reporting Medallion goes to Dan Barry, Jeffrey Singer, and Todd Heisler of the New York Times. Dan Barry uh, could not be here at this point because he had to, is he here? Oh, Dan, they, they gave him some information. They said you were leaving to attend another Times event. This must be the event. Good, delighted. We'd like you to, we'd like you to, no, 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 go ahead. We'd like you to say a few words. Quickly, Jeffrey join in. Thank you, everybody. So. For every story that we do, we always hope to find that one special piece of reporting that along the way that kind of breaks it open, makes it easier. And um, that really never came. You had to do a lot of work. And um, yes, the community is very insular. There's no compelling reason for them to necessarily tell you about their um, illicit businesses. So it took a lot of time. So. Um, and um, fortunately, there eventually there was some bit of uh, of a break. There was some uh, um, some headway that came. And um, for me, for, you know, throughout my short career, I've um, had some luck. But I would say I thought about it, and I've gotten luck on every story, really, to be honest with you. You know, there's always that one thing. But for me, the lucky part I decided was my collaboration with my colleague Dan. That was the lucky part because it was, uh, sure, we were both dogged, we were both hardworking, we both tried very hard to, uh, to honor the life of this person who was more than just a um, sex worker. There was more to her life and it had to be more than a salacious headline or it had to be, um, something that required more than just language to get at the bottom of, you know, to, to and um, yeah, so there were very many long nights, um, and uh, Dan and I uh, got to know the family who came here, and uh, it was difficult. Um, why should they share their lives with us? But Dan has a way of transcending language, really, and uh, and um, together we, we pulled it off. Um, I just want to say that um, oh, I'm on a roll. Okay, that that it was. Uh, how am I doing? Doing well. All right. So I just want to say that um, the family um, really uh, it was them who had opened up to us, and it wasn't easy. They wanted, they had their own agenda. They felt that they wanted to um, find who did this to their uh, um, sister and, and uh, daughter who, who, and, and hold someone accountable. And it was, um, it took a lot of digging to, and, and a lot of persuading to have them actually want to share uh, the, the details. Yeah, it took a, and it seems obvious, but it, it didn't come in an obvious way. Um, you know that that butterfly, that the motif we use in the story. Well, well, that came about through m many long talks, and the brother, for example, if you read this, he didn't he didn't feel it was necessary to, to think of that. It, that that's not important. So, uh, so. It, it turned out, oh yeah, you know, we had him draw a little bit. Talk about that. Is that all right? Yeah. And draw a little bit. And, and we would draw what his house and his property looked like in China. And through that, he would recall, yes, uh, you know, th this is where we planted these crops. And oh yeah, and then after school, her friends from the nearby, uh, the school was just nearby, they would come over and they would play on that platform that's known as a, a kong, which is uh, like heated in the, in the winter and it keeps cool in the summer. And they would play, and then Song Yang uh, you know, would, would share her, uh, her, her their butterflies. But how did we know about this? It came through Song Hai recalling the, uh, the dragonfly net, not the butterfly net. He called it the dragonfly net, he described it. 
and and it was slowly over the course of time and drawing this this came out but and so yeah that was a special thing but the most the most special part really of making the story happen um, was um, my seamless collaboration with um, my friend Dan and um, that's Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. There were two merit awards for feature writing for his piece called Housing Crisis in New York City, which explored the situation in the Bronx and found that what the city calls affordable housing might be beyond the means of many of that borough's residents. For that piece, the merit award goes to David Cruz of the Norwood Muse, a community <laughs> weekly. The Norwood News is a community weekly covering the Northwest Bronx. Uh, so David, congratulations. The second merit award in the feature writing category is for Ben Weiser of the New York Times for his moving and well-researched piece called A Bright Light Dimmed in the Shadows of Homelessness. Ben's story brings to life a homeless woman who would otherwise be a nameless, faceless abstraction, another familiar part of the urban landscape. Ben Weiser. Please take a bow. Just about a year ago, a bunch of fifth graders from a school in Paramus, New Jersey, were on a class trip to Waterloo Park, a restored 19th century canal town about 45 miles away that is now an open air museum that depicts life in the 1800s. They were on their way when their school bus collided with a dump truck on Route 80 in New Jersey. One student and one teacher were killed. 43 others were injured. Photographs and videos began streaming into the newsroom of the record NorthJersey.com. They were the work of staff photographer Bob Karp, the first photographer on the scene. And some of them were taken while he was trying to stay balanced on the railing of an overpass while being steadied by a reporter. Their appearance silenced the newsroom while vividly conveying the horror and heartbreak of the scene. For his outstanding work in the story, Class Trip Turns Deadly, the 2019 medallion for breaking news photography goes to Bob Karp of the record NorthJersey.com. Accepting on behalf of Bob Carr. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris. The first news of the aforementioned collision between a dump truck and a school bus. This was last May, May 2018. The first news of that hit the newsroom of the record NorthJersey.com via the images filed by photographer Bob Carp. Instantly, reporters raced to the scene. Many of these kids were their neighbors. They began talking to people, gathering the details that covered an area encompassing three counties. Reporter Steve Janoski used a network of his sources in law enforcement to ferret out the details of the crash, learning, among other things, that the bus driver was attempting an illegal U-turn on the highway at the time of the collision. Meanwhile, this was alluded to before, environmental reporter Jim O'Neill stepped away from covering environmental matters, and he began stitching together feeds from colleagues positioned on opposite ends of the three-county coverage area 
to weave a compelling narrative of the day's tragic events. For their real-time work in presenting Class Trip Turns Deadly, the 2019 Breaking News Medallion goes to reporters Jim O'Neill and Steve Janoski and the editorial and photography staff of the record NorthJersey.com. Just, um, you never know what's going to happen on a busy news day, right? And um, luckily we had great photographers, great reporters out in the field gathering the information. Um, when you're the person back in the newsroom, it's pretty easy to do the work when you have such yeah. great material coming in. Um, and um, what we tried to do is convey the um, this was just a regular day for a bunch of kids who had anticipated this um, trip, a school trip, a day like any other, um, that went then terribly wrong. Um, and to try and convey that um, in a more of a narrative way to our readers, many of whom actually were parents and relatives and teachers of these students. Um, so it's just, you always need to be ready to go and um, having such a great staff uh, really made it much easier to do uh, on a day like that. And um, the thing is to remember the people you're writing for and telling their stories and trying to put yourself in their shoes on a day like that. So thanks very much. Thank you, guys. I have just one more. Uh, I have just one more chore, and that's to turn over the microphone back to our president, David Andelman, who's going to tell you about our final award of the evening. It's a very special award, and that's why we saved it for now. Ladies and gentlemen, is the pre uh, president of the Silurians Press Club, David Andelman. Well, um, I, I like to say that um, mm -hmm. Newsday is bookending this year's Silurian's Excellence in Journalism Awards because just just what it is. So my final duty tonight as president, though really it's far more an honor and a privilege than any duty, is to present this year's President's Choice Medallion. Now, this is an award for a project that transcends all categories. And this award really does just that. It's what the Oscars might call the Best Picture Award. It happens to go to Newsday. I should confess, Newsday was my first newspaper job when it was in the old um, plant sandwich between the local gas works and uh, Roosevelt Field in Garden City. And my job was night beat reporter for North Hempstead Town. That was when I had my first experience of the reality of grassroots politics and corruption. And that's just what we're honoring tonight. Not the corruption, but the exposing of this phenomenon that had become an entire way of life on Long Island, at least until Newsday fielded an army of journalists to unmask this web of deceit that spread from a one-time street hoodlum who transformed himself into the master of the island's political clubhouse. So let me first of all show you this is the reportage. No, it's not the entire paper, but it's an entire section of a paper, all devoted to one amazing story. And that's what we're honoring tonight. But I think we should let those who perform this remarkable public service tell us themselves. And I'll let Debbie call all the winners to the podium. So Sandra, <laughs> Keith, <laughs> Will, Juan, Laura. Yes, and Debbie Henley. <laughs>
Uh, you know, I was talking to my colleagues earlier tonight, and we were sort of in awe of all the name tags that were walking by of people we have read and viewed and admired for years. So it's really amazing to win this award and be in your company. And we can't thank you enough. So thank you very much. And I should also mention our editor, Marty Gottlieb, who couldn't be here tonight because he's flying in from Greece. So I don't feel sorry for him. He came into Newsday and he fell in love with the story. And I don't know if many of you have had this experience, but he's this wonderful guy who tells you your writing is just so wonderful. Let's just tweak it a little bit. <laughs> and I would say we rewrote the stories 15, 16 times, and we're still speaking to them. So I don't know how that happened, but thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that's it for this year. I'm confident many of you in this very room are already hard at work on the reporting and editing. Never forget our editors that will land you back here a year from now for my final turn at the podium. So for all of that, Godspeed, and let's have one final round of applause to these amazing award